In the spirit of Kuji Tagulia, which is Swahili for self-determination, the Delta College Department of Ethnic Studies brings you Profiles in Equity and Excellence, a virtual presentation series for 2022-23. This speaker series will highlight Black, Indigenous, and people of color who are professionals and are advancing equity, racial, and social justice efforts in various contexts. All students, faculty, staff, and admin are welcome. It is with great honor and joy that the Profiles of Equity and Excellence series introduces Cynthia Smith, a powerful educator, counselor, community leader, program developer, and entrepreneur who has made a tremendous impact in the Sacramento region for decades. Cynthia has over 20 years of experience as a teacher and academic counselor who has taught all grade levels in K-12 schools, including community college and adult school as well. She is the founder and executive director of the esteemed Sisters of Nia Incorporated, a culturally based after school program in Sacramento that has successfully served hundreds of youth for over 13 years. She is also the CEO of Sweet Teas, a black owned travel service. Her dynamic leadership has impacted students, families and the community as a whole for decades. She will share her life's journey and highlight the supports as well as the challenges that have led her to success as both an entrepreneur, an, educa an educator and an incredible force of empowerment for students. Welcome, Cynthia Smith. And everybody can see the screen? Mm -hmm. All right, awesome. So yes, just like Dr. Homicide uh, said, my name is Cynthia Smith. Um, and I'm gonna start with just sharing some personal mantras with you. These are um, some sayings, Dr. Homicide. I gotta call you Malika, sorry. Malika may know, this is my friend. I don't call her Dr. Homicide, I just call her Malika. Uh, but. I'm sure some of these might look familiar to you. Um, my favorite is excuses build bridges to nowhere. Um, and it's so true. Like you can make all the excuses in the world for why you can't do something or why something, you know, something's not working, but really that's not going to get you anywhere. Um, it's all about trying to problem solve and, um, you, you know, figure things out. Um, so that one is one of my favorites that I would use with students, especially because <laughs> students love to come with excuses, but that's what is, where is that getting you? Absolutely nowhere. Um, my favorite, another favorite is uh, believe and you will achieve. And this is something that I've been um, using since my first classroom of students, but it's really true. If you believe that you can achieve something, you will achieve it because if you believe it, you're going to work toward achieving whatever it is that you're trying to achieve. So if you believe it and don't doubt yourself, you will achieve it. And one of my personal uh, affirmations that I tell myself every day is I am worthy of all good things. And that's everyone. We are worthy of all good things so that good things can continue to come my way. So a little bit about my background. Um, those are some pictures of me in my younger year. Malika, this one is specifically for you with the with the jerry curl. Some of, <laughs> some of you, I don't know, you may not know about the jerry curl. Uh, but I grew up in Fremont, California, which is a small town in the Bay Area. Um, when my family moved there, we were probably one of the first, or if not the first, Black family to move into the neighborhood. Um, I went to um, Harvey Green Elementary, and from first grade through, I started that school in first grade, and from first grade through third grade, I was the only Black child at the entire school. Um, and then my brother came when I was in fourth grade, um, and then a couple of other Black families came. Um, so that was definitely interesting. Um, so at school, I was the only Black child, but my um, I was raised in church as well. So at church, I had a whole different um, experience. It was a Black church. Um, my young adult life, um, as a child, I was always um, definitely, and I would say academic. <laughs> um, I started reading early um, when I was in elementary school in third grade. I was asked to go back and, or I'm sorry, I think it was fourth grade. I was asked to um, start tutoring second graders in reading. And it was myself and one other um, person who were asked to go and um, tutor. And that's where I really developed 
um, the love of teaching. Um, I, I did definitely have some major impacts in my life at a young age. Um, like I said, I did well in elementary school, but um, middle, junior high school and high school was a little bit of a different story. Um, my grandmother passed away when I was in seventh grade and she and I were really close. And, and because she lived out of state, she lived in Chicago, I wasn't able to go to her funeral or to, to say goodbye. So that definitely had a negative impact that, that lasted with me for a while. But after that, soon after that, my father decided he didn't want to be a father anymore. And he basically just walked out. Um, and that had long lasting impacts um, on my life, which um, kind of um, had positive impacts at the same time, which I'll share about a little bit later. Um, uh, so in, in middle school and high school, because of that situation and all in, into my uh, early adulthood life, um, I definitely had some challenges making good decisions. Um, but some of my greatest strengths during that time was definitely, um, my, I was definitely passionate about um, education and I was strong-willed. Um, I was, um, tut I actually continued tutoring throughout high school um, so I definitely enjoyed, knew that I had a, a love and a natural ability for teaching, um, but my challenges were myself. I was getting in my own way um, because of the, um, the personal impacts that I had dealt with. So when I was in high school, um, that was, I mean, I'm really dating myself, but when I was in high school, that's when computers really started to become a thing. Um, and um, even though I had talked about becoming a teacher throughout my elementary and middle school and, and most of my high school life, um, because computers were introduced to the scene, I was strongly encouraged to pursue a career in computers. Um, and we'll talk about how that impacted me as well. Mrs. Smith. Yes. If mm -hmm. I could just make a quick announcement. I want this to be interactive. So any of you, when you can relate to something that you hear, right? If, if uh, you know, she says something that, you know, happened to you as well, or that you experienced with, or questions that you have, please feel free to type in chat and I will try to be checking the chat throughout the entire presentation. There will be time at the end to ask questions and to um, talk a little bit more, but it would be wonderful if we make this interactive. So anytime you feel something or you know you can agree with something or you're like, oh, heck yeah, go ahead and post in the chat that you can relate. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, so I did um, go on to college uh, after high school. I started at Chabot Community College or um, I think it's Chabot Junior College. Uh, I stayed there for three years, having a, a grand old time. Uh, and then I ended up transferring to Cal, or I'm sorry, to, to Sac State. I transfer, transferred to Sac State, I think it was 1990, um, with a 1.7 GPA. And at that time, we, we still had affirmative action. And that's how I was able to get into Sac State. And um, I was still pursuing a degree in computer science or in computers. And um, the first couple of years were great. I got connected with an organization called uh, the National Society of Black Engineers and developed some excellent connections and got very involved. But through the two and a half years I was there, I realized that computers was not my love. That was not my passion. And while I was part of the National Society of, uh, part of well, NSBE is what we call it for short. While I was in NSBE, I was the uh, chapter president, and also after that, I became the pre-college initiative chair. And um, that is when I redeveloped my, my love for education. Um, I organized different um, conference camping conferences with uh, Sacramento high school students. So it was a high school uh, conference um, that myself and a couple of other of us with the uh, Nesby organization pretty much developed. And again, it was through those conferences which that um, kind of reminded me that, you know what, computers is cool, but you really want to be a teacher. Um, so I ended up staying at Sac State for about two and a half years, and I ended up transferring, trying to transfer to East Bay. Uh, but because my grades weren't all that, um, East Bay, and at the time it was Cal State Hayward. Uh, Cal State Hayward was like, no, thank you. Um, so I went back over to um, mm -hmm. Chabot College and um, mm -hmm. took classes there for about a year and reapplied to mm -hmm. uh, 
Cal State Hayward. And fortunately I was able to get in. Um, so I was able to graduate Cal State Hayward in about four quarters, which um, at one quarter, during one quarter, I was enrolled in 31 credits. And I remember telling people I was in 31 credits and they were like, you mean 13? And I was like, no, I mean 31. Um, but I passed on my classes, got all A's and B's, um, and then went on and pursued a um, credential, a teaching credential, and got straight A's in my teaching credential. Um, so once I decided to pursue my passion, getting good grades was easy. Um, so that's one suggestion I would have to make sure you follow your passion. So I, um, later in life, I went back to school and got a, a master's in counseling studies, but um, I was really, really proud of myself. It took about nine and a half, 10 years for me to complete my bachelor's degree. So um, I really was really proud of myself for not giving up and pursuing, continuing to pursue. In 2000, uh, I got married. Um, my, uh, my husband and I are still married. We've been married a little over 22 years now. We have two daughters, um, ages 23 and 21. Uh, my oldest daughter lives in Tampa and my youngest daughter is in Houston. Um, my mom is in Texas. Um, my mother has been a tremendous inspiration and role model throughout my entire life. Um, super strong woman. Uh, when, my, when my father left, she was stuck with um, raising myself and my brother and trying to, um, you know, pay them rent or their mortgage and make sure that we have food to eat. And she uh, just always persevered and always stayed positive. Um, so she's definitely a strong role model in my life. Super proud of my daughters. My oldest daughter, well, actually, both of my daughters have followed in their mother's footsteps. And my oldest is teaching special ed in uh, Tampa, and my youngest daughter is actually a sub right now teaching high school in, um, in Houston. So a little bit about my K-12 background. Just like Malika mentioned, I have taught literally every grade level from K through adult school to um, community college. Um, my first group was in 95, 96 at Hope School of Excellence. It was a small, um, uh, Christian school with just one class per grade level. I think I had 10 or 12 students, um, but I loved it. I loved it, but I was only getting paid $1,500 a month, so I couldn't survive off of that. So the following year, I uh, was hired at uh, Strowbridge Elementary, where I taught second and third grade, and um, I think one of the things that I really, well, let me back up why I chose education. I kind of touched on that. It's just it was ingrained in that, like it was just a natural thing for me to go into. Um, I enjoyed working with kids. I enjoyed um, tutoring. I also had worked in preschools. So going into education was just a natural thing for me. Um, what I really loved about teaching when I first got into it, though, was the freedom of the curriculum. And things have changed a whole lot since 1995. Um, but when I first began teaching, you'll see that little, that picture of the spiders over there, that's a spider's thematic unit. Um, and, you know, back then it was really common to have thematic units where you had one topic, but that topic went across math and went across science, history, just everything. Um, so I enjoyed at that time, the freedom to be able to create my own curriculum and use that with my students. And as long as my students were um, showing that they were learning on those tests, the, those standardized tests, it, I was free to use whatever curriculum I wanted to use or to create my own curriculum. So that was one of the things that I really enjoyed. Um, but I will say that when I did go into teaching, I went into teaching knowing that that was not what I wanted to do with my for my entire life. I went into teaching saying that in, in, in five years or in 10 years, I want to have my own school. Um, so I always knew in the back of my mind that there was more that I wanted to do besides just teach. So um, I... Uh, have a picture over here. This is my fifth grade so the class. Um, you can see some different hairstyles too. I have fifth grade. This is a uh, second grade class, both at the same school. This is another second grade class at a different school. So in elementary, again, literally every grade level from K to six. Uh, my challenges, I would say, was when I came to um, Elk Grove, honestly, and, and started teaching there. And I didn't have the same kind of freedom that I had when I was teaching at my first job or a second job in Hayward. Um, 
there were certain curriculum you had to follow. There were certain things that you were required to do. Um, and I didn't necessarily agree with everything that I was required to do or that that was the best way to educate my students. Um, so that was definitely a, cha a challenge, which kind of took some of the joy of being a teacher out of being a teacher. Um, and it, which ultimately is kind of what led to me uh, leaving the classroom. Um, what I loved about counseling, uh, though, was I get, it was a different kind of connection you develop with students. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit later because I was at a different school. Um, and then again, advice for current education majors. Uh, one, make sure that you're in it and, and that's because you're passionate about it. If you're going to go into education, you definitely need to be passionate about it. And also, um, you have to be willing to learn about your students, be willing to develop meaningful, real relationships with your students and also be willing to share about you, some personal things about you, not too deep and personal, but some personal things about you so that they know that you are actually human and that you're relatable. Um, so uh, I left the classroom in 2008 and went to Heritage Peak Charter School, started over there as um, a homeschool teacher where I would actually go to the students' homes and teach them in their in their homes. And then later um, I was a um, regular, well, independent study teacher where students actually came to the site and met with me for about an hour. And then later transitioned to being a, a counselor working with high school students. And I think one of the things that I really enjoyed about being a counselor, like I said, was the relationship was a little bit different um, than being a teacher. When you're a teacher, you really, you know, on them about those grades, you, you know, you, it's, it's a different type of thing. When, when you're a counselor, I felt like I was able to be more motivational, um, to provide more inspiration, to, brought, to provide resources, to really educate them about what life was going to be like after they got out of high school. Um, and one of the things I really enjoyed was taking my students on um, college tours. Uh, so I was able to schedule all kinds of college tours um, throughout Northern California and take students um, to, to visit different colleges that they would not normally have had an opportunity to visit. And um, after Heritage Peak, I went over to Highlands Community Charter School, which is an adult school um, servicing adults 22 years and older looking to complete a high school diploma. They also service adults that are new to the country looking or not new to the country, but looking to learn English. So when I initially transitioned there, I was um, working with um, English learners, English language learners, teaching lang uh, English language learners at level zero to two, which mean that they, you know, some of them had never even held a pencil in their hands, or some of them didn't know how to read or write in their home language. So that was um, a, a, a real challenge for me, but an enjoyable challenge because they were all there excited to be learning English. They, it was Their attitudes were um, very inspiring. And some of the things that they shared that they've been through, just unimaginable. Um, but being at Highlands was definitely rewarding. Um, helping adults complete a high school diploma, um, adults who've been through lots of personal challenges, lots of things that deterred them from completing that diploma when they were in, in high school. Um, so it was definitely very rewarding. And one of the most rewarding things about being at Highlands was my counseling team, very diverse counseling team, very wonderful, probably one of the best experiences I've ever had um, in the field of education. And I had to throw this in there too, um, Los Rios Community College. So I, I taught for two semesters at ARC just before or just as COVID was hitting. So I started in 2019 and I taught that spring semester of 2020 and COVID came and shut down the classroom and we finished on, on Zoom. One of the, my, my most memorable, th I, I loved it. This was probably my most enjoyable year of teaching because um, it was just a, a unique experience. Um, definitely have some great connections with my students. But one of the worst things that happened um, during that time was my second semester, I had a student who was, she and I had um, become, started to communicate quite often. And she worked at a, um, a mental health facility. And unfortunately she was, she was murdered while at work, um, stabbed. So that was one of my worst experiences. But the way that, cl that class rallied around each other um, was 
probably one of the most memorable experiences because um, she definitely left a, a positive mark on, on all of us. Um, so I think the way the class rallied around was, was very impressive. Mrs. Smith, mm -hmm. there are condolences coming into you, uh, you know, about the loss of your student. That is certainly tragic. Um, there is also a question, though, if you could go back to the, the Highlands page with your counseling team. One of the questions that just came through is when you mentioned working with your diverse team and that was your best experience. I mean, forget about the time that you worked with me, you know, what I'm saying? You know like, you know, OK, I ain't hurt. I ain't salty. That was great, too. That was great, too. <laughs> <laughs> we did work together for many years. Yeah, we worked together for a decade. She didn't mention, but it's okay. Anyway, I'm just messing with you. Um, the question is, what was such a good experience about working with this diverse team of, of counselors? And what about diversity made it such a good experience? That, that's a great question. Um, I think one of the things that made it great was that we could all kind of relate to um, some of the, well, we could relate to different experiences that we were experiencing at work. So different um different things that hit as far as um, how we were being treated, um, different opportunities that were given, how the team as a whole were looked at, um, different um, little things like hair. Um, those things came up. You know, the young lady with the curly hair right here, she had lots of, lots of people who wanted to touch her hair, things like questions about her hair. Um, we have this young lady who very outspoken, um, she's doing some wonderful things in the community, but felt like, um, our, well, at the time, our executive director, she felt like he was intimidating. Um, and, and she, it was just, it was just a great group of people to be able to, um, uh, feel comfortable sharing about how we felt in the workplace, and um, different, and, and also how, how we felt about being who we were in the workplace. Meaning uh, people of color, you mean? Ex exactly, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. um, and then also uh, myself and this young lady over here. Um, so I was the supervisor and these were, this was my team and they were all about the same age, about 30. So they called me their work mother and this was their work auntie. And it really was a, a family that we created at work. Um, but, and, and today we're still very close. Um, but all of us felt like this was a unique experience that none of us had ever experienced in any of our previous workplaces. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Smith, could you just go back one slide real quick? Because somebody asked who is my daughter, because I have to say, oh, Mrs. yes, Smith came into my baby's life um, in high school, as a matter of fact, and I'll start crying if I talk too much about it. But, um, you know, she really changed the direction of my own child. That's my that's my little girl. Uh, she's 26 now, so she's grown now. But mm -hmm. this was way back in the day. And Mrs. Smith um, and her attention as an educator and her care and compassion changed the trajectory of my child. So I, I thought it would be, you know, important to let y'all know that that's mine. And, and, you know, Mrs. Smith made a huge impact in our life and in the life of my child. Testify. Awesome Thank teacher. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I will say too, being an independent study teacher gives you an opportunity to connect a little deeper with students than you would if you were in the classroom. Uh, because you are meeting either in small groups or one-on-one, -on -one, so you do get to know them a little bit more intimately, which I actually, I, I really enjoy that. And any other questions before I go forward? Okay. I don't see any in the chat. Okay. So, um, Sisters of Nia. So, Sisters of Nia was, was started in 2009. Um, that's a, it's my nonprofit. I'm the founder and the executive director. I, when I went back to school and uh, got my master's degree in counseling studies, this is where Sisters of Nia was born. Uh, I was unsure really, I thought I wanted to be a counselor working with um, high school students like it, well, that's what I did, I, but I thought that's why I was going to get this master's to pursue that. But in reality, I went and got this master's and ended up with the nonprofit at the end of it. Um, I was, 
um, doing some research for the program and came across a curriculum called Sisters of Mia, which is a, I think it's a 10 or 12 week curriculum by Dr. Faye Belgrave. And when I saw it, I was like, this is exactly what I want to do. Um, but instead of it just being 10 or 12 weeks, I want it to be a three year program that supports girls in middle school. I chose that grade level because that's around the age when I started having some personal challenges because um, what, like I mentioned earlier, my grandmother had just passed away. And soon after my father walked out. Um, so I thought middle school was a good time, a good age group to, um, to pursue this program with. So um, uh, my inspiration was really, it really came from Dr. Faye Belgrave's work. So the program is a, is a three-year rites of passage program that does service middle school girls in grades six to eight. And our focus is building self-esteem, leadership skills, academic achievement, mother-daughter and father-daughter relationships. But the program is culturally based and built on uh, eight principles of Afrocentric living. So the girls are taught these principles um, and every lesson is designed around one of those principles. So um, cooperative economics and respect, um, unity, um, creativity. So those are some of the principles. And so every lesson is designed around one of those principles. Um, and every lesson also is connected to um, yeah, an African um, proverb. Uh, and then again, culturally based. So in sixth grade, we start with the fact that with the girls that Africa is a continent. Um, they're going to learn about different countries in Africa. They're going to learn about Queens. Um, and throughout the three years of the program, we kind of build on that and really um, give the girls a solid sense of, of history so that they have a solid sense of who they are. And our ultimate goal is that our girls learn to live their life with the purpose. And we started, like I said, in 2009 with just 12 girls. We only take 12 girls per grade level. Um, and now those that first group of girls, they graduated college in 2020. So they're out um, in, the, in the work world. We stay connected to all the girls in the program. Um, so as long, as long as they want to be connected to us, we stay connected to them. And a lot of them come back and volunteer for different events. Um, some of them come and volunteer for the, um, for the monthly meetings with the girls. But the, one of the big benefits is the community that is built um, with the girls. Uh, so they don't just have their parents, they have us and they have us for, for a lifetime. I still have girls, I have girls now that are um, in college that will reach out for letters of recommendation or they'll reach out for advice or they'll reach out, you know, for whatever. So the benefit is that, the, is that they have us forever. It's kind of like a, a sorority that they join when they're in sixth grade that they get to be in for the rest of their life. Um, some of the, the challenges of Sisters of Nia have definitely been finances, um, just having the funds to be able to run the program and then also to be able to pay people. So myself and Dr. Hollinside, we've been doing Sisters of Nia since 2009 as volunteers. You know, we just this year, last year rather, were um, in a situation where we've been able to start paying our facilitators. So we've been volunteering with the program a long, long time. But and I want to say something because you might be humble through the uh, grant writing and through the promotion and, and the nonstop community presence that Mrs. Smith has created last summer. How much money we gave away? Fifty thousand dollars. Yes, fifty thousand in scholarships. Yes. Last summer, I'll let you speak on that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, and actually, let me see because that's on one of the pages. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk on that when we get to that page. But the question, there's the question also, what careers have our girls pursued? Mm, so we have a lot of, quite a few teachers. We have um, engineers. We have some that have gone into the medical field. Um, let's see. Oh, we have several young ladies who have their own businesses. Um, we have several girls that are pursuing um, business um, degrees. So those are just some that I can think of off the top of my head. I don't know if I'm missing anything, any careers, Malika. Uh, but these are some of the uh, community programs that we have. Um, we, in addition to the monthly meetings that we do with the girls, we also have a camp program that's a performing arts program. So, and Dr. Hollandside is the leader for that program. So the girls will actually, they, for two weeks, they learn dances, songs. Um, 
They learn their lines for the skits, and then they also work on set designs. And then at the end of the two weeks, which is really eight days, they put on an amazing performance for the community. That's all led by Dr. Hollandside. Um, these are pictures from our Rites of Passage program. So at the end of the three weeks, the, um, uh, sorry, at the end of the three years, the girls have a Rites of Passage celebration where they graduate the program. And it's, it's a time for us to celebrate them as uh, young ladies going into high school and um, their parents have an opportunity to share um, how they feel like their daughters have grown in any words of wisdom. And it's, it's a super emotional event. Um, we also take our eighth grade girls to Atlanta. This is a picture from At our last Atlanta trip this past June. So at the part of their rites of passage is uh, this Atlanta trip, which is an Atlanta Black history slash HBCU tour. So we visit Spelman College, we visit Clark Atlanta University, um, we do tours there. And then we also visit everything Martin Luther King, the um, birth home, the church, the burial site, the King Center. We visit um, the Apex Museum, which is a hands-on African history museum. And we visit the National Center for Civil and Human Rights, which is a hands-on civil rights museum. And all of those really bring to full circle everything that these girls have learned in the program the past three years, and they're able to see it with their own eyes. And it's really a life-changing experience for them. Um, once they've gone on this trip, they, they come back a different person. We do some fun things too to kind of balance out all the heavy, but that's the bulk of the trip. Um, some more pictures from Atlanta. This is our one of our uh, graduating groups. They are now in 11th grade. Um, this is from our past scholarship celebration that we just had. So yes, we received a grant from the California Commission on the Status of Women and Girls for $50,000 to be awarded in scholarships. So this past summer, we awarded 42 young women scholarships that are pursuing either just graduating from high school or pursuing um, continuing with their undergraduate or perhaps pursuing a doctorate or um, some kind of higher education. And then these are some of some flyers from um, our uh, programs that we've offered. We have quite, it's a very comprehensive, but very grassroots program. I don't know of any other grassroots programs doing what we have done. Um, so we've held a, a health fair, a community health fair. Um, we have our summer performing arts camp. We have a youth leadership conference uh, that's actually coming up in November. Uh, the scholarship awards reception. We have our, our woman on fire. We do a um, gospel brunch. Um, there's a, all kinds of different activities and programs that we hold throughout the year. So um, before I move forward, are there any questions about Sisters of Nia? I'll go back a slide. So the question is, where is it based off of? And where is it growing, as a matter of fact? Because we now have an opportunity to grow, you might want to speak about. Great question. So we meet in Oak Park. We've always been in Oak Park. And we, we actually started in Oak Park is a small community in Sacramento. We started at PS7 Middle School, which is in Oak Park in Sacramento. And we were there for about five years and, and um, have moved to a few different locations, but have landed at um, Highlands Community Charter School, who they are actually giving us a space to use um, to hold our meetings. Um, so and I'm sorry, what was the oh the growth? There's a lot of growth happening. Um, th there's been a lot of growth this year. So this year was the first year we were able to bring back the summer camp. Um, we haven't had that camp in about, what, what is that flyer? Is that an old flyer? Maybe 10 years? I don't even know when we had the, fly, the, the last camp. It's probably been, been a minute. Been been a minute. Years. So that was huge growth. We had 42 girls who completed the camp. Um, we also have two groups of sixth grade girls in the program this year. And this is the first year that we've ever done that. Uh, so instead of just 12 girls being in the sixth grade program, we have 24 girls in the sixth grade program. Um, and then also we have an opportunity to partner with Fortune Schools, which is a charter school in Sacramento, specifically for African-American students um, to bring our program to three of their middle schools. So um, definitely excited about that growth opportunity. One of our goals is to create affiliations or expand our program through having other Sisters of Nia programs elsewhere so that more than just Sacramento-based folks can, can experience the program. So this is a wonderful opportunity. And our ultimate goal is to be able to grow outside of California as well. 
One of the questions in, in the chat is, do you find that the girls become more civically minded and engaged? Absolutely. Yes, especially, um, and Malika, you probably could talk this a little bit too, but we have a couple of young ladies who have, well, one in particular, Quiche, who has been very vocal and very um, active in the Sacramento community, especially um, during 2020, 2021, when there were, we were kind of at the height of some cultural issues in the Sacramento area. Well, not just in Sacramento, but across the country. Uh, we have girls who, once they learn the truth about their history, definitely go back to their classroom and, and begin to challenge what they're learning or being taught in the classroom. I feel like they become um, more confident in speaking up uh, when they hear things that they know are untruths. Um, and definitely more confident about being active in their community when it comes to um, um, politics and things like that. Can you speak, can you speak, um, oh, there's another question. Can you help the audience understand what an Afrocentric education is? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So it's really based on the principles of black living. So some of those principles that I um, named off to you are the, so I don't know if you've heard of Kwanzaa, but some of them I'm sure have heard of Kwanzaa, but Kwanzaa has eight or seven different principles. And so basically those are the principles of Afrocentric living. Um, we added an additional one, um, an eighth one, uh, which is Hashima, which means respect. But it just may, means to teach them about their history, to teach them about um, who they are as a person, um, for them to feel comfortable and confident in who they are as a person, as an African-American young lady. So. Um, one, another question. Oh, what was the eighth one again? Uh, that's Hashima, that's respect. I'm going to post in the chat the, the different just to help help Miss Smith out so she can keep going with the presentation. I'm going to post the principles in the chat so that you guys okay. can refer back to them as well. Can you speak on the fact that even though this is an African-centered organization, we certainly um, have participants who are not Black? Absolutely. Yes. Anyone is um, open to welcome to joining the program. We've had girls of all different kinds of ethnicities be in the program um, from white, from um, Native American, from um, Hispanic, um, Indian. So you do not have to be African-American to be in Sisters of Nia. And actually, I think it's a it's a it's a, a, a benefit to them um, to be in the program because they get an opportunity to learn the truth about black history, about African history as well so they they can um you know perhaps grow up with a um a better idea of what it means to be black now we've had some girls that have come through the program who um really strongly connected with what we have uh, what, you know with the curriculum with the things that they've taught been taught um so so much so to the point where you know we had a couple of girls who wanted to identify as african-american um but i think is um, girls that come through the program who are not African American definitely will uh, be will have a strong benefit from coming through this program. Any other questions for me? All right, I'm gonna keep it moving. Okay, so um, in 2020, I told myself that. June 30th of 2022 was going to be my last day working in education. Um, and it didn't happen June 30th, but it happened September 6th. Um, I decided to leave Highlands Community Charter School um, really because I, I wanted to be able to work for Sisters of Nia full time and really be able, wanted to make that program grow. Um, and it was extremely challenging to do that when I was working full time with another organization. So that was my reason for leaving. So now I'm full time executive director with Sisters of Nia. I'm actually being paid something, not quite what I should be, but it's something I can live on, which is a, a huge step. Um, and I'm loving it. I'm, I'm really enjoying it. And I also get to do my travel business, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but being able to uh, work for myself is a tremendous blessing. Um, and especially to work for myself with Sisters of Nia is a tremendous blessing. Uh, my future goals with the program is just to help it grow. Uh, and we, it's amazing how things happen. Um, you put things out into the universe and, and 
and you write things down for myself. I'm a, a goal oriented person. So every year I do a personal retreat and I write down goals that I want to achieve for the next year. And having the first Sisters of Nia affiliation was one of the goals that I wrote down. But in all honesty, I hadn't done a whole lot of work toward making that happen because there were so many other things that were happening. Um, I did make a couple of phone calls, but Fortune reached out to us and asked if we would be interested in bringing our program to them, which is, it, it means that the, the word about what we're doing, about what Sisters of Nia is doing, about who we are is getting around, and they felt like it would be a, a good program to bring to their students. So I just want to keep working on helping this program grow, and it feels amazing to be able to be in this situation. So... Um, so in addition to Sisters of Nia, which is really like my full full time job, I also do Sweet Tea's travel services. Um, I started this business with my husband uh, back in 2017, and I had been or, uh, organizing travel for Sisters of Nia for years with our um, Atlanta trip. Uh, not you know organizing the flights, the hotel, the transportation, just everything. That, you know what are we going to do every day? Um, and my husband and I happened to be on vacation in 2017. It was the first time that we had ever been to a, a five-star resort. And I was like, I want everybody to experience this, like especially other people of color. And really my, my purpose for coming into the travel business was to really promote other people of color to get out and see the world, get a passport and go see the world. Um, so it is, um, there's a lot of training and education that goes into it because there's a lot that you have to know, but it's, it's for me, it's exciting and rewarding. Um, but the biggest challenge is, um, trying to plan travel, working with people who then decide they're not going anywhere. So after I put in a few hours of work, they are like, oh, I'm not going anywhere. I, I've changed my mind. So that's probably the biggest challenge. But even with that, the rewards definitely outweigh the challenges. So not only do I enjoy and get to enjoy helping other people plan their travel, but I get to travel at much lower costs. Sometimes I get free travel. Um, and I've just been able, being a travel agent has allowed me to get out and travel a whole lot more and just to be able to see things that I would not have normally been able to see. Um, so that's what I absolutely love about being a travel agent. What was the training again? What what exactly, like how long did it take and how intense was it? So it's, it's really up to you. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's really up to you. <clears throat> the person I work with, um, the training is all online. So it, however long you choose to take is how long it's going to take you. It's kind of like um, what I used to tell my students when I was a counselor at, at Highlands. They would ask, how long is it going to take me? It's going to take you as long as you want it to take you. Um, it's the same thing here. So all of the training is online. It's not going to take that long. There's minimal training to get started. But if you want to be good, you have to do on, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, continual training so that you stay abreast about different things that are going on. For example, when COVID hit, um, there were some things were changing constantly, right? Like flights were being canceled left and right. People's vacations were getting canceled left and right. So there was a lot of things that you had to make sure that you were, that you stayed abreast on different um, countries had different entrance requirements. Um, so you have to know about that if you're sending clients there. But again, the training and the education is not, it's minimal to get started, but it's ongoing throughout the career. These are just some pictures um, from different places I've, I've visited. I think my favorite place is Cancun. I, I love Cancun because no matter, it's consistent and you're always gonna have a good time. The weather's always, well, usually great. Um, but some places I've visited uh, besides Cancun, I've, I've been to um, Cabo, I've been to the Dominican Republic, I've been to Jamaica, um, I've been to Antigua. Um, I love the Caribbean. As you can see, those are my favorite places to go. So um, on my bucket list is to get to Ghana. So I'm going to get there. Um, so advice uh, while in school. Really, um, I kind of spoke on this a little bit earlier, but make sure you're in, in something that you're passionate about, um, that, you, that you really enjoy doing. Um, it makes a huge, huge difference. It's going to make a difference in how, how, you, um, how you excel in school, is gonna make a difference in your quality of life when you're working, um, when you get out of school. So that kind of goes into professional life after graduation. Again, 
hopefully you're able to go into something that you're passionate about. Uh, because being in a career that you're not passionate about is not fun. Um, so if you are currently pursuing, or, or if, let me back up and say, if you are in a, in a career that you may not be passionate about, try to find something else outside of that work that you are passionate about, like a Sisters of Nia or some other program that you can volunteer with or get involved with, or start something of your own that you're passionate about. Um, but definitely you want to make sure that you're doing something in your life that that brings you joy. Um, and then advice for life in general, um, do things that make you happy. And, you know, don't worry about what other people have to say. When it came to Sisters of Men, when I was first telling people that I wanted to take the eighth grade girls to Atlanta, they were like, they thought they, they thought it was a joke. They were like, you sure you don't want to try to take them to visit colleges in LA? It's a lot cheaper. How are you going to get all that money? That's a lot of girls to try to take all the way out to Atlanta. But we did it with our very first group of eighth grade girls and have been doing so ever since. Um, you can do anything it is that you want to do. Whatever it is that you want to do, all you have to do is be willing to work toward doing so. That's about all I have. Um, but again, um, if you have any other questions, please don't hesitate to ask. I'm happy to answer any other questions you might have. And I just wanna say to Dr. Hollenside, thank you again for having me. I really appreciate this opportunity. And if you're interested in reaching out regarding Sisters of Nia, this is my email. This is our website. The um, website has some lots of detailed information about our program, but you can also follow us on Facebook. Our Facebook page has up-to-date information with all the different activities and events that we have going on and pictures as well. And if you're ever interested in travel, this is my email for uh, booking travel and our website for our travel business. And then we're also on Facebook, Sweet Tea Travel Services on Facebook. And after that, I'll stop my share. Well, awesome. Hey, this is so amazingly fantastic. And thank you so much for sharing your energy and your journey. You are such an inspiration. This is a person who manifests things from nothing into something, right? And, and not only for her own benefit, but for the good of, of the people and the good of the community, you know? And, and I think that's part of the reason why Mrs. Smith is so successful is because you know, when you put good energy out into the world, it comes back to you. When when you put energy out there that improves lives and that makes people happy and that improves family relationships and give, gives people hope, then you got a lot of good karma coming back to you. And that's why Cynthia has so much good karma. Hey, there's a question that was posted. It's actually more of a comment, but let, let me pose this to you because I think it's really important. It's uh, And this is from Marisol's iPhone. It says, it's unfortunate how sometimes the careers that we want are so unattainable or underpaid. What, what would you say to that? That's, unfortunately, that's real talk. Um, and, you know, it's interesting that you bring that up because both of my daughters are actually dealing with that now. And the same thing I just told you all, it's the same thing I would tell them. Um, Sometimes you have to create your, you might have to create your own space. And I say that um, some, maybe you need to, and when I say create your own space, um, that's what I have to do with Sisters of Mia and that's what I have to do with Sweet Teas. Um, unfortunately, and, and again, I'm, both of my daughters are in teaching and my oldest daughter was just sharing with us today that it's so stressful. She's not sure if she wants to stay in this career. Um, and what is she, you know, how is she going to figure out what she's going to do next? It, it really takes some looking in her, looking at your inner self and really, you know, thinking about what it is, what are you really passionate about? And sometimes it's not all about the money. Sometimes what you're passionate about may not come with a whole lot of pay and that's okay. Um, as long because the, really the most important thing in life is that you are happy and what it is that you're doing every day, every day. And that you're you're staying positive, and like um, Dr. Hollandside said, that you are bringing positive vibes because that's going to help bring somebody else up. Mm -hmm. um, but that's real talk. Unfortunately, it's, it's it can it can be challenging to find careers that pay well 
and that you're passionate about. But I would say this, though, too, because something that you've always been able to do and something that I would love for our students or everybody online to, to think about is, you know, you can do more than one thing. Right. Like you can hold down a nine to five. It might not fulfill everything in your heart. Or maybe you work with people who are, you know, stressing you out. Or maybe you're confined by the system or the rigidity of whatever organization that you're working in. Right. But that's why you do something else on the side to give you Absolutely. that. Joy. You know, you have to have more than one channel in life. And this lady right here is an example of how you could have 12 pots on the <laughs> stove cooking at one time, right? And and fulfill fulfill your joy, right? Don't just don't just be in an unsatisfying job mm -hmm. and not create a channel for yourself that will give you that balance. It's possible to do that, y'all. And just like you see in this example here, uh, you know, Cynthia Smith took a passion that she had that maybe she wasn't making a lot of money out of at first, but through years of perseverance, now she's living life. She, I mean, you know, she got us jealous over here. You know? <laughs> being able to work full time in the nonprofit and in the talent, I mean, in the travel service too. So it takes perseverance, patience, dedication, um, you know, and, a, and, and a lot of, uh, you know, uh, energy and good energy and hope, but, um, it's possible. So this is Absolutely. an inspiration. And, and you're right. And thank you for saying that. And it does take a lot of work. And when you, when you venture off and do things on your own, if you have your own business, you're going to work a lot. Um, but it's the payoff is so much greater. Um, I, so I do work a lot. Um, I work nonstop, but the payoff is great. I still get to enjoy life. I still feel like I'm, I'm, I'm definitely happy and I'm doing things that I love and I get to still enjoy life. Um, so thank you for saying that. At one time, I think I had four jobs. <laughs> uh, and me, me and uh, Dr. Homicide talk about this sometimes. Dr. Homicide had three or four jobs and probably still does. You know, so you definitely you, you're not going to find everything in just that one that one career, or that one job. Definitely want to have other streams. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at a few of the comments in the chat. Um, one of the comments was that's something that held me back from aiming to be a teacher. There are a lot of people that I think, you know, are, are, are you know, held back from entering the field of education because of what's considered the stress or the low pay or whatever, what would you say to anybody considering becoming a teacher? Well, I, if that's your passion, you should do it. Um, the pay is, is well, honestly, I don't feel like the pay is super low, but it's low compared to what we should be getting, but you will be getting paid a livable wage. Um, and there's excellent benefits, but again, I feel like um, if you are passionate about helping young people and being a teacher, then you should pursue that. And there's other, other avenues besides just being a teacher that you can do to make an impact. So you might start as a teacher, but maybe you end up being a, a vice principal, a principal, or doing something else in the realm of education. Um, but definitely don't not do it just because of the pay, because pay should not necessarily drive um, what your choices are. You want to make sure that you're doing something that you're passionate about and hopefully someplace that you can actually make some positive change and, and a positive impact. Mm -hmm. So. What advice would you give to young people whose parents or guardians are steering their goals rather than the young person, which is creating attention? So I would recommend for the young person to be honest about what it is that they really are, what they want to pursue and share that with their parents. And if they feel like, you know, saying it verbally is challenging to maybe write it down and, and give them, you know, write a letter, write it to them in a letter and give, share that with them. But definitely sharing what it is that you want to pursue is important. You have to make sure that your voice is being heard. Um, so I would recommend speaking up about what it is that you want to pursue. And if the parents are not necessarily interested in hearing that, I mean, when at some point, then, you know, you're going to be going off to college or doing whatever it is that you do. So you just got to make sure that whatever steps you take are steps that you want to take for yourself, uh, because it is your life and you're the one that has to live it. And you want to make sure that you're doing what it is that you want to do. You're not living your life to please other people, even your parents. You're living your life to make yourself happy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. True. 
as a counselor, what would your response, that's what you would say to a student if a student came to you and says, my, my mom doesn't want me to be, you know, in cosmetology. She wants me to go into law. <laughs> Well, if I were a counselor working with high school students, then I might be, I might approach it a little bit differently. So, my, and I actually might bring the parent in on the conversation. Okay. Um, and, you know, and, and kind of be that middleman, you know, that middle person, if you will, to help that student express themselves. But it's different for adult students. Absolutely different for adult students. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you so much. Are there any other uh, uh, questions or any other comments I'm checking the chat right now it's two o'clock we are so thankful to everyone who has participated I know that you know we have a little bit of wiggle room because we have a few more minutes to be online if you desire or if you have any more questions are there any questions or comments um, I'm seeing in the chat thank you for the opportunity to hear your story and your inspirational messages thank you for the work that you're doing for humanity and many blessings to you yeah. Thank you. And I also see, you know, admirations for your grit, resilience, and compassion. Thank yous. A bunch of different thank yous. So, yes. And I would just say, just to reiterate, you know, stay true to yourself. Never give up. Excuses build bridges to nowhere. You are uh, worthy of all things good. And um, just do what you need to do to make your dreams come true and and they will and you'll be amazed thank you so much all right well we are so thankful to have you and thank for you. your time thank you everybody who participated and for um you know showing our wonderful speaker your love and appreciation um, we look forward to seeing you all again in our upcoming um, next presentation, which will be taking place, if I am not mistaken, I'm looking for the updated flyer. I just dropped it. Did you put it in chat? I just dropped it in chat and we have awesome. Dr. Chow, Daddy Chow Vang, December 6th. Awesome. Okay, so hopefully y'all could see my screen right now. And this is our updated flyer. So December 6th, which is again, it will be a Tuesday. It will be same time. It'll be the same Zoom link. So if you are interested in continuing with these wonderful presentations, we'll see you on December 6th. Okay, I'll stop sharing my um, little flyer. All right, everybody have a wonderful day. Be blessed, stay warm, stay <laughs> healthy. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and in the chat, as we're going out, it says you are amazing presentation. You are nothing but a positive light in the community and has truly made me see life in a different perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As Cheryl Lee Ralph said. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, That's wonderful. Good. Yeah. Wonderful. All right. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful day. See you next time. Bye. See you December 6th. Thank you so much for joining us for this session of Profiles in Equity and Excellence. Make sure that you check out the other videos that are available on our YouTube series so that you can continue to explore the great things that people in our community, in our areas are doing for the people. May peace be with you all and we look forward to seeing you next time.